Good morning, Living Waters. It's good to see you guys. I like this service better than the first service because you clapped for me because I was back. So, anyway. There you go. It's good seeing you guys. I hope you appreciate it and enjoy the ministry of my dear friend, Al Force. Did he share that story about us being in Europe? First class tickets and riding back with the thieves and pickpockets and all that kind of stuff. The story he told is not all the story. There's actually a R-rated version of that story that if you're interested, I'll tell you in the lobby later on. But uh, it goes much farther than that. But anyway, uh, Al's a great friend and an incredible communicator, and I'm sure we'll have him back in the future. Let me mention just a couple of things to you. Uh, tonight is our night of worship. Man, we're going to have a great time tonight. Come on out. We're going to be here for about an hour connecting with God, experiencing uh, the presence of God as part of our vision of living, living waters is to experience God. We want to experience the presence of God. And we know that when we gather together in a like-minded fashion, come together as believers in Christ and worship Him, that God shows up. And so come on out. Be a part of that tonight. We're going to have a good time. Also, uh, part B of that is if you have not been baptized, the Bible commands that we're baptized. If you become a follower of Christ, if you are a follower of Jesus, uh, baptism is not just a good suggestion, it's a command. And what baptism is, it's an outward expression. It's letting the world know. It's letting the people around us know. It's the outward expression of an inward decision that we made to follow a Jesus. And so if you haven't been baptized on your way out today, uh, on the right-hand side is our welcome center and information center. Please stop by. And uh, there, there should be a list that's right there. Write your name on the list that you want to be baptized. And then be here tonight at 5.30 p.m. right over here in room 101, and uh, we'll baptize you. We'll get you baptized, and you can make your declaration of public faith. And uh, so we encourage you to do that. If you have not been baptized, please be baptized tonight. There shouldn't be anything to stop you or hinder you. There should be nothing fearful about it. It's an exciting, exciting time. So get baptized, all right? And um, we're going to continue on in our series, and actually next week we'll wrap up the whole series on wrestling with God, and then you saw we start a new series called Dry Bones, which is going to be based on Ezekiel chapter 37 and Ezekiel's vision of the dry bones in the valley. It's going to be a lot of fun during that time. Um, but today is, is kind of a cool sermon and message, kind of a cool talk for us, because it's the culmination of what we've been talking about. This whole series called Wrestling with God is the story of Jacob. It's Jacob wrestling with God. And today we actually see the wrestling match that took place with him and God. It's, it's a curious story. It's an intriguing story. I don't understand everything about how God wrestles with men. But it, nonetheless, it's a story that we see in Genesis chapter 32 that shows us Jacob actually wrestling with God. And actually, we're going to see it. it's actually Jesus. It's Jesus in the Old Testament. And he's actually wrestling with Jesus. And, and so uh, let me just kind of catch up to speed on where we've been over the past few weeks. We saw that the name Jacob actually means heel grabber. That Jacob, he's a deceiver. He's a, he's a cheat. He's dishonest. He's, he's a guy that's tried to get ahead in life. And, and if you remember weeks ago, it was Pastor Daniel who preached and shared about him cheating his brother Esau out of his birthright. And then the following week we looked at where um, him and his mother, Rebecca, they actually conspired together to, to get the birthright or to take the birthright by their own means through Isaac. And, and so he deceived, his, he deceived his dad, Isaac. And then he ended up fleeing to his uncle Laban's house. And Esau, his brother, was in pursuit of him, trying to kill him. And he had that experience with God at a place called Bethel. And he named it Bethel, which means house of God. And it was where God gave him a vision and a dream of angels ascending and descending up and down the ladder. And we looked at that story of Jacob's ladder, or the stairway to heaven. And we saw that God was communicating to Jacob that, Jacob, I'm not just distant and somewhere far off, but I'm right here. And it's not just you reaching up to me that I'm coming down. I'm coming down after you. And so we saw that. And then we saw him go to his uncle Laban's house where he ended up getting married. And if you remember, he fell in love with the beautiful Rachel. Rachel, who was Laban's youngest daughter, and he agreed to work for seven years for uh, Rachel's hand in marriage, but on the night of their wedding, Uncle Laban, who is as big a deceiver as Jacob was, maybe a little bit bigger of a deceiver, as big of a cheat at least, 
he ends up sending his oldest daughter, Leah, in instead of Rachel. And so Jacob ends up marrying Leah instead of Rachel. He, the deceiver, gets deceived. And then in turn to marry Rachel, Jacob, uh, and Laban says, you've got to work for me for another seven years. So um, kind of where we are in the story, Jacob is married right now to Leah and Rachel. It's been seven years. He's married to two women, but then they have maidservants. So Jacob has had 11 sons, one daughter, with four women in seven years. Jacob's been busy. <laughs> Jacob's been on the go. He's been doing a little more than just working all day long out in the you know, fields. And so, so Jacob now begins to have conflict with his uncle Laban. His livestock increases, his herds increase, but at the same time, God is blessing Laban uh, through Jacob. And so they get to the point where they've both acquired some wealth. And so Jacob realizes it's probably time to move on. It's probably time to make, take the next step. And the Lord comes and tells Jacob, Jacob, it's time for you to go back to the land of your father. It's time for you to return home. You've been here almost 20 years. It's time for you to go back home. And so Jacob packs up his belongings. He packs up his family and all the, the, the wealth that he's acquired and, and, and kind of the entourage and all the people that are with him that are traveling together. And they begin to set off for him to go home. And as he begins to get closer to home, he realizes now that he is going to have to face one of his greatest fears, one of his greatest stresses in life, one of his greatest anxieties that he's had now for more than 20 years, and that is facing his brother Esau. If you remember, Esau, not only did he cheat him out of the birthright, but then Esau felt like he got double cheated because then Jacob ended up taking the blessing also from the dad, from his dad Isaac. So he doesn't know what's going to happen. He no, has no idea, is Esau still mad? Is Esau still angry? Is Esau still ready to kill me? He doesn't know what's ahead. And so as he travels back, as he gets closer to home, he decides that he's going to break his family up into two different groups and separate them. And he begins to send gifts ahead. He begins to send servants of his ahead to Esau's people. It's kind of his group of people going to Esau's group of people saying, hey, your servant Jacob is, you know, tell, 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 your, tell my master Esau that his servant Jacob is on the way home. He's trying to appease him by offering him all these gifts. So Jacob doesn't know what the relationship is or what's going to happen. And we find that Jacob actually splits his family up into two different groups. And that's where we pick up the story in Genesis chapter 32, verse 22. It says, my screen at here. It says that during the night, Jacob got up and he took his two wives, his two servant wives, and his eleven sons and crossed the Jabbok River with them. And after taking them to the other side, he sent over all his possessions. So he sends his family over, he sends all his stuff over. So now, look at this, verse 24. This left Jacob all alone in the camp. So Jacob has sent everything over. His family is all gone. He's kind of sent them ahead. And what I like about this story, and, and, and we already, we, we see a little bit of change that takes place in Jacob right here. We see that God has already been dealing with him on a variety of levels. One of the things you've got to realize is Jacob for a long time, Jacob has only cared about himself. He's only been concerned with his own destiny, with what he could grab, what he could get, what he could skirt around. He has been a deceiver most of his life and tried to take matters and means into his own hands. But for the first time, Jacob is actually caring about somebody else. He's concerned for his family, which is one of the reasons he breaks them up into two groups, so that if one is ambushed, at least he still has part of his family left. So, so he's concerned for his family. He sends them. Jacob now is left all alone by himself with none of his possessions, none of his family around. God had him in the exact spot he wanted him to be. Often, God deals with us in life, and I think back to some of the experiential moments that I've had, and some of the big growth moments I've had in my own personal life, in my own journey with Jesus, it's happened in those moments where I'm alone, where I'm isolated, where I've kind of got alone by myself, that God shows up in those moments. And that's what we have here. We have Jacob, he's left all alone, he's all by himself, everything stripped away, left to himself, and look at verse 24. And a man came. A man came and wrestled with him until the dawn began to break. This man that we're going to see when we read the next couple verses is not just any man. This is God, or if you will, it's the pre-incarnate Christ. This is Jesus in the Old Testament. Jesus shows up and wrestles with Jacob 
all through the night. Got to understand, Jacob has been wrestling his entire life. Jacob has been wrestling against his family, his dad, his brother, his mom, Uncle Laban, against everybody. He's been wrestling his entire life. He's a late bloomer because he's right around 100 years old right now. But he's been fighting and wrestling his whole life with everybody. He's been fighting for his destiny, wrestling with his destiny, fighting for blessing, wrestling with blessing. And now what I love about the story, I'm going to get excited in a minute. But what I love about the story, it's not that Jacob initiates initiates the fight or the wrestling match with God. It's God showing up in Jacob's life and saying, you've been fighting and wrestling your whole life with everybody and everything. If you want to fight, fight me. You want a real fight, take me on now, buddy. You want somebody to fight with and somebody to wrestle with, why don't you stand up to me? And all of a sudden, God is trying to get Jacob's attention. And I love this. I mean, we think of God. We like to think of God that when God reaches out and God touches our life, that it happens in the quietness and in the stillness. And if we can just get alone in the presence of God, I like to call it spa God. We love spa God. If I get a little, if I get a little owie in my life, you know, I get a little place, oh, I just need, I just need to get in God's presence. I just, I just need to lay down. If I can just lay down, then, then God can massage the owie. God can massage the hurt. God can massage the pain. He can help me out. And, you know, he can put the little warm towel under my head and he can prop my feet up and, and he's going to be there and he's going to comfort. Oh, he's going to comfort all my pain and it's, it's going to be good. I, I like spa God. This ain't spa God. This is fight God right here. You want to fight, let's fight. You want somebody to fight with. You want somebody to wrestle with. You've been wrestling your whole life. Now it's time, wrestle with me. And we see as God initiates this conflict that we see that it's the same story that we saw even earlier, that it's God pursuing Jacob. And it's the same thing that happens in our life. We think, have you ever heard somebody say this before? This is the old phrase. If you've been around church for any number of years, you used to hear this phrase. I heard it growing up. Oh, I remember people would stand up in church and they would testify. They would stand up in church and say things like this. Oh, I remember back in 1972, I found the Lord. No, I remember back in 1968, I was in this little church, and when I was in that little church, I'll never forget the preacher was preaching, and this happened, and that, and that was when I found the Lord. And I thought to myself, that's wrong, because the truth is, we never found the Lord. God found us. It was God pursuing us. When I look at my life, it wasn't that all of a sudden, one day I had this epiphany. I look at the, my life, and I was wrestling, and I was contending, and God was pursuing me. It's God initiating the struggle. And that's the other thing. Think about it. God initiates the fight. He initiates the wrestling match. We think something happens. You know, bad bad things happen in our life. And when bad things happen, this this is where we go to a lot of times. I can't believe the enemy is coming against me like this. I can't believe that the devil is just all on my back right now. Oh, my this is happening, I've got this problem, I've got this struggle, or this, this concern, all this is happening. Everything just, everything's just unraveling. Everything's just, you know, these things are messing. My relationships are messing. All, everything's, just, everything's just horrible, right? Get thee behind me, Satan. You're not, you're not going to bring me into this position. You're not going to bring... And we blame everything on the devil. The devil's got so much credit in the past for stuff he never even initiated. But we blame all this stuff on the devil. Could it possibly be that God says, hey, you are fighting and you're wrestling. If you want somebody to fight with, fight with me. Wrestle with me. Could it possibly be that struggles in our life, that some of the struggles that we're facing, maybe some of the struggles and the things that you're dealing with right now and the questions that you're asking and the ways in which you're contending may not be you fighting the devil at all. Maybe you're fighting God. Maybe you're wrestling with God. God allows it. God God takes, this is the crazy thing, It's it's not that God creates sin or makes us sin or makes sin happen, but at the same time, God can use the failures, he can use the mess ups, we talked about this in our relationship series, the mess ups, the slip ups, the hang ups. He can take all of those things and use them in our life in such a way that bring us to a wrestling point even with him where we're wrestling and contending for our faith. And that's why wrestling matches take place with God. 
one of the reasons that God was wrestling with Jacob is because God was trying to get Jacob to come to the end of himself. God was trying to make a man out of Jacob, trying to produce in him a faith that was lasting, a faith that is forged in difficult times, a faith that is forged in hard places, in a wrestling match, in a contending. If you, if you don't have a faith that you've had to wrestle for, hang in here with me and just kind of listen to where I'm headed with this, but if you don't have the type of faith that you've had to wrestle for and contend for, where you've struggled with God on issues and struggled with God on challenges and, and you've had to struggle on hard things that God has said or not, if you don't have that type of faith, then your faith probably does not have a lot of strength to it. My faith has been developed through the wrestling that I've done. It's through the whys and the why nots and the, and the wrestling with God in different areas of life and different areas of relationship and different areas of, of, of job and ministry and kids. And that, that, that's, that's where faith is forged. It's in those wrestling moments that God is trying to make us men and women. He's trying to build a stability in us. He's trying to build in us a faith that is lasting and not some weak, insipid, weak need faith, but something so that when tough times come, when difficult times come, when hard times come and we're laying our head in hard places and we're laying our head on a rock and we're in a difficult place, that we still, regardless of all of it, we still have the faith to believe that God is in control. That's the kind of faith that God is building in us in wrestling matches. That's what he's doing in our life. That's what he's doing in Jacob. He's trying to build a faith in Jacob because Jacob's life is going to transform. You're going to see this is a transformational place of Jacob's life here in this entire story that we've been looking at for almost two months. This is the life change moment for Jacob right here. He's had some encounters with God and he's had some experiences with God and even earlier in the chapter, angels came to visit him. So he knows of God. He's heard God. He knows that God is there. But this is his crossroad moment where his faith is forged in the God of his father Abraham and of Isaac. And this is the moment where he is now making it his own faith. God is wrestling with him. It says in verse 25 that when the man saw that he would not win the match, he touched Jacob's hip and wrenched it out of socket. And then he said to the man, let me go for the dawn is breaking. Inter interesting, it's kind of an interesting statement there for, for him to say that, that when the man saw that Jacob was overpowering him and, or when he saw that, that he would not win the match, well, that just kind of blows my mind because, Ed, you're telling me that this is God wrestling with Jacob, but that God thinks he's going to lose the match? Are you trying to say that that, that, that verse says that, that God's going to lose the match or that he was struggling all night long and he thinks he's going to lose? It's not like that. And we're going to see this in just a second. You know, um, when I was uh, on staff in Orlando, Florida, at a church, I was serving as one of the executive pastors there uh, at a large church. And um, it, it was a great season of our life, great season of our family. We had a great time. Some of my best memories, other than Living Waters Community Church in ministry, happened um, while I was at Calvary Assembly Winter Park in uh, Orlando, Florida. Great time. Uh, some of my best relationships still to this day happen there. But we had, uh, as a family, we used to clown around and play around. And we had a pool at our house. And my kids during that time, they were, I think Brooke was probably seven, eight, six, seven, eight years old, somewhere in there. Bryce was nine, 10, 11. He was, uh, my kids were kind of at that age where, I mean, we just had fun. I mean, I, and I don't know how you grew up, but I grew up wrestling. Actually, we call it wrestling with an A, W-R-A, wrestling, you know. And, and, but but I, I just grew up wrestling and fighting and, and clowning around. And, and so my kids, even from, I mean, from the time they were like a year old, I was wrestling with them, clowning around, being rough. And, of course, I had my mom, oh, you have to be careful with those babies. You got to be, well. and so, I mean, but, but I was just wrestling because I wanted my kids to be tough. I wanted to, and so we were always wrestling. And so we, 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 used to, and we used to do this other game. It was always fun. We called it daddy football where, where they would get down on the floor and they would try to, you know, cross the end zone and they would try to get ahead, you know, and we would play this game sometimes for, you know, more than an hour just wrestling around on the floor. 
But we had this one game that we used to play in the pool. It was called Wedgie Wars. <laughs> now I was bigger and stronger, and so Wedgie Wars always worked for me, never against me. So we would get in there and, you know, the kids would have their bathing suits on and I'd grab them from the back of their bathing suits and pull them up and throw them in the deep end or, you know, kind of throw them halfway, you know, across the concrete when I missed the pool. And <laughs> they'd get up all bloody and jump back in the pool and we'd wrestle some more. But, but you know, we played these wedgie war games and they'd be grabbing their bathing suits, dad, dad, and they're screaming and, and fighting and we're laughing and cutting them. We're playing, you know, we would go out and play in the pool and we want to play wedgie, dad, let's play wedgie wars. And we'd start playing wedgie wars. But then they started getting a little bit older. And Brooke one time, she got up on the side of the pool in this wedgie war wrestling match, wrestling match, and she jumped out at me. And I saw her coming, and I knew I needed to defend myself or she was going to break my neck. So I put my arms up to catch her in midair so that she just doesn't, you know, collide on my face. And as soon as I reach up to grab her, Bryce, in his little sneaky, conniving way, <laughs> quickly jumps behind me in a split second, and the fight was on. He grabbed a hold of the back of my bathing suit. And he began to just pull that bathing suit. And I'm just like... And to this day, that's why I sing three octaves higher when I'm in worship. And, and I mean, he grabbed on. And now I think he was probably like 11 years old. And so he had, he's bigger now. He's stronger. And he, he was, it was like a bulldog. I mean, he had my bathing suit like a bulldog. And I'm thinking to myself, if this does not stop soon, I'm going to have to go to the hospital. I mean, it's really bad. And so I, I, I start laughing, and I'm laughing until I'm crying. And literally now I'm starting to get in pain. I'm like, it's almost, now I'm in pain, you know. It's like crying now because I'm in pain. And Brooke, she sees me laughing. So she thinks it's all my strength is gone. And so Brooke jumps on, and now it's four hands on the back of my bathing suit lifting me up out of the pool. This was not fun. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. I was still three times their size. And if I really, really wanted to, we were playing games, we were clowning around and having fun. But if I wanted to, I still had the power to get out of it. I could have knocked their hands away, screamed at them, pushed them aside. But they were grabbing on. They were holding on. See, when it says, look what it says. When the man saw that he would not win the match, he touched Jacob's hip and wrenched it out of the socket. Isn't that? It's kind of weird. He saw that he couldn't, over, couldn't win the match against Jacob. Then all he had to do was just with one finger touch, touch the socket of Jacob's hip. So you know what God was communicating to Jacob? Jacob, I've got all the power. All it takes, you can wrestle with me all night long. You can fight and you can contend all night long. But in one split second, I can totally take you out, buddy. I've got all the power. I have all the power. God was trying to get Jacob in this moment to come to the end of himself to come to the end of his own strength, the own ability. See, for so long, Jacob, like I said, you've, if you've been here, you've, if you haven't been here, please go back online or on our app. You can download our app, uh, the iTunes store. You can go back and listen to messages. But, but Jacob, the whole time, everything that he has done, he's done in his own strength. He's done in his own ability. And look where it's got him. 100 years old, a family that's a mess. He has no idea what's at home. And he's sitting now, fearful, anxiety, stressed, not knowing what's getting ready to happen with his brother Esau, left all alone. And that's where God deals with him. God was trying to get Jacob to come to his, the end of his own strength, to finally, for the first time, and that's what Jacob does for the first time in his life. Look at what it says. It says, but Jacob said, but Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. I will not let you go unless you bless me. To wrestle means to contend. contend. When, when you wrestle, you, you fight, you contend with somebody. But for the first time ever, Jacob, for a hundred years, had been contending for everything that he got. And for the first time, even with God, 
for the first time, he moved from a posture of wrestling with God to clinging to God. Two totally different things. Wrestling and contending, fighting against God and clinging on to God. God finally got Jacob in the posture and a position where Jacob was at the end of himself. He had come to the end of his own strength all night long of fighting against God, his whole entire life culminating in this moment. He had finally got to the point he was exhausted, all strength had left, all, his, all, all the tenacity had left, all of those things had just completely de- depleted from fighting not only his whole life, but that whole night fighting with God. And finally, he gets to the point for the first time in his life where he grabs onto God and he says, I'm going to cling to you. I'm going to cling on to you and I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. I want to tell you something. That, let, me, let me talk to the men for a second here. That's the cry of a real man. Bless me. The world would say that as men, and there's so much pressure on men today, that you've got to provide, you've got to make it all happen, you've got to forge your own way, and you're, you're the maker of your own destiny. If you don't go out and get it, nobody's going to help you, and, and you've got to make your own things happen, and you've got to carve out your own path in life, and you've got to do this, and you've got to do all that. And we have all this pressure as men, as providers, as men, as guys that want to succeed in life and be somebody. I mean, that's just the truth. That's, that's in most men. You want to do something of significance. There's that significance all inside of you. But the world says you've got to go down this path. Jacob went down that path and look where it left him. It left him all alone. But the cry of a real man says, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. That's the cry of a real man. And that's what God's doing to Jacob right now. God is wrestling with him. He's not trying to make Jacob a sissy. He's trying to make a man out of Jacob. He's trying to make him into a real man of God, not just some kind of sissy that sits around and does his own thing or tries to do his, you know, takes matters into his own hand. God's trying to get him and says, listen, I told you back at Bethel that the promise that I made to your grandfather and your father, that the promise is going to be lived out through you, but there's no way that it can happen if you still stay in your sissified state, trying to take matters into your own hands, trying to do your own thing, carve out your own. It's never going to happen until you become a spiritual man of God. And the only way that is ever going to happen is when you stop fighting against me and you start clinging on to me. Until you hold on to me. Until you realize that you don't have the strength to do what I am calling you to do. That it's not in your ability. That it's not in your wherewithal. It's not because you've made great decisions or or because you've got the great manly strength. That is not how you're ever going to succeed in the promise. The way that you're going to have victory, Jacob, in the promise and the way that you're going to be the man of God that I'm calling you to in this divine moment is through complete surrender and submission to me. That's what a real man does. A real man Listen to me, guys. A real man submits himself and surrenders himself to God. You surrender and submit yourself to God, and you let your family see that, and you'll see a remarkable change in your family. And the lie of the enemy, the lie of the enemy, I've heard people use this analogy. I heard one person say this to me before, that Christianity is just a crutch for weak people. That's the lie of the enemy. We've got to, as a man, we, you know, that, that we're weak because we rely on somebody else. We'll just look at the story of Jacob. He had so much more than you ever did, and look where it got him. And he finally got to the place where he said, I'm going to stop relying on myself and my strength and my ability, and I'm going to reach on and I'm going to cling on to you and hold on to you. And he says, I want you to bless me. I want you to bless me. And one of the lessons that it's teaching us right here in the scripture is that you cannot hold God hostage for blessings. You, you, can't, you can't put God in a corner. You can't, you can't snatch God's blessings out of his hands. And isn't, isn't that the thought sometimes that, that God is this stingy 
God and he's sitting up in heaven, but he has all these blessings that he's just hanging on to. And, and the only way that we're going to get those blessings and if somehow we cry enough or whine enough or pout enough or take, do, do our own thing enough that somehow we're going to manipulate God into such a way and just pry a blessing out of his writhing, tight hands. That's what Jacob had been thinking and God is saying, here's the deal. You can't pry the blessing out of my hand. You can only receive it. You can only receive it. And so the man says this. The man says to him, he says, what's your name? Isn't that crazy? It's God. He's, re he's wrestling with God or, or Jesus. He's wrestling with Jesus in the Old Testament. He's wrestling with him and he asks him what his name is as if he doesn't know. I mean, he formed this guy. He created him. He knows his whole story up through this hundred years. He knows everything about him. Why would he be asking him his name? It's like Jesus. I mean, if you look at the life, years ago I did a series here called The Questions of Jesus. There are times that Jesus asks questions in the New Testament. And it's not that Jesus doesn't have the answer. It's that he's asking the question because he's trying to draw something greater out of the individual through their answer. And so it's not that God doesn't know. Oh, all of, this whole night I've been wrestling with Jacob. I had no idea. Wow. What's your name again? Jacob. Oh, yeah, that's right. I forgot. Jake the snake. Yeah, I got you. He says, what's your name? He says, Jacob. Let me say, tell you what he was saying. What, what's your name? Can you see Jacob laying down just a pile of mess? You, you fight all night. I fight for 10 minutes. I'm done. You wrestle and fight against somebody that can overpower you the entire time. You fight with them all night. You're a mess laying on the ground. Your hip completely out of socket. The man standing over you, God standing over him, Jesus standing over him. What's your name? What's your name? You see Jacob looking up at God. My name's Jacob. A surplanter, a deceiver, a liar, a cheater, a con artist. It's been my whole name. That's what they named me when I was born. That's been my destiny. It's been who I am. And I can see God looking over in verse 28 and saying, you know what? Your name will no longer be Jacob. But from now on, you're going to be called Israel. And as a matter of fact, an entire nation is getting ready to be birthed through you, buddy. You're going to be the father to 12 tribes of Israel. Thousands of years to come, there's going to be a place on the globe called Israel because of this moment right here and right now. Your name is Israel because you've wrestled and you've fought with me and you've contended with man and fought with man and you've overcome. You've overcome. Wait a second, this, this is kind of baffling. He's laying on the ground a mess, worn out, defeated, but yet God is telling him, you've just become victorious. You know what that tells me? Is that victory in God is found in surrender and submission to him. That's where it's found. This transformation that now takes place in Jacob's life, and you're going to see his life is altered from this point on. His life has changed. Things are different. But what I love is here's Jacob laying on the ground. You guys give me a couple more minutes here. He's laying on the ground, and he looks up at God. He doesn't, I'm sure he doesn't, I, I, maybe he's just starting to get an inclination because it says that, that God reaches over. Look at verse 26. Jacob looks up, and he says, what's your name? My name's Jacob. I, you, know, you know everything about me. What's your name? I love what God says. Why do you want to know my name? Basically, what's it to you? What, 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 why, are you? why are you asking me for answers? And then it says that he blesses him. He doesn't, an, he doesn't even answer his question. Isn't that crazy? He, he, he just said, I'm going to change your name, and now you're going to be Israel because you've contended with man and you fought with me and you've overcome. Your new name's Israel. You used to be a cheat, Jacob. Now you've contended with God and you've overcome. Your name's Israel. 
Why doesn't God say, well, I, I, I'm, I'm this, or I, I, you know, I'm God, or you know, let me tell you what's getting ready to happen. Why doesn't God do that? All he does is reaches down and he blesses him. And here's the reason why I think God says nothing to him is that it was such a life-altering moment for Jacob and such a life-defining moment for Jacob that he was simply saying to Jacob, Jacob, I'm not going to give you all the answers. I just want you to trust me. I just want you to trust me. But what, what about my brother Esau? Is Esau going to kill me? I want you to go, and I want you to trust me. What, what about my family? Is my, is my family going to be... Con- protected or are they good they're over on the other side of the river is there another group of men are they trying to kill them Jacob I want you to go and I want you to follow me he doesn't give him any answers and that's what's crazy about the story is there's no and that, as a preacher I like resolution I want I want to read the story and he blesses Jacob and then all of a sudden you know Jacob gets up and, and the family's okay and everything's great with Esau and, and I want to communicate that part of it but we're left at the end of the chapter with absolutely no resolution and I think it's intended that way because there are situations that happen in our life. There are struggles that we go through. There are wrestling times that we go through where we don't understand why God does what he does and we can't figure it out and we contend with God and we fight for why is my marriage the way it is or why are my kids the way they are? Why are my finances the way they are? Why is my job the way it is? And we fight with all these things and all these things that are taking place and we're asking God all these questions and sometimes God does not give us the answers that we're looking for and if anything, there are moments where God is silent and we're wrestling and we're contending and the best we get is from God where he simply says, listen, I'm going to say nothing right now. Go and trust me. Trust me. So there's not resolution for you today other than this. That wrestling forges your faith. It'll build you in the tough times. And it'll build your faith to the point that when you have other wrestling moments where you can't figure life out and you can't figure out why the dots are not connecting the way they are, you're able to go and say, you know what, God? I don't understand. And I can't hear you right now on everything. But I trust you. I trust you. Last verse and then I close. I love this story. And next week, we're, don't miss next week because next week I'm going to talk to you and share with you about how to walk through life with a limp because Jacob, for the rest of his life, he walks with a limp as a reminder of what God did in that wrestling match. Anytime he would walk along, people would say, hey, why are you limping? Well, let me tell you about this one night I had. And so I'm going to preview for next week. Last verse, verse 30. Jacob named the place Peniel. That's how you pronounce it. But I'm going to change the pronunciation. I'm going to call it Peniel. Jacob named the place Peniel, which means the face of God. For he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been spared. In wrestling moments with God, and I close with this, you're like, you've said that four times. But I close this. That means that I'm halfway there. (laughs) In wrestling moments with God and contending and wrestling in faith, wrestling through questions in life, wrestling through struggles in life, things that we don't understand, wrestling through our own identity and character and all those things, wrestling all those things in life, we have one of two options, either to live in a place of penile I'm going to take God on face to face and I'm going to be with God and cling to God in this or a place of denial. I'm going to turn my back on him. It's either penile or denial. And perhaps some of you here today have been in a place of denial. And it's not the enemy. The enemy enemy hates you and wants to destroy your life. But there may be some things that you're going through right now in some circumstances that may not be the enemy. That could be some struggles that God has allowed in your life to bring you to this culminating moment where you will release it and instead of wrestling with it, cling to him. 
surrender yourself. Submit yourself so that he can bless you and so that you can learn to trust him. Bow your heads, let me pray for you. Jenny, come on up if you would. Father, I pray for every person in this room. Lord, I know that there are some people here today. They are wrestling with life issues. They're wrestling with struggles. They're wrestling with identity, who they are, where they're headed, what's going on, where, where relationships are headed, where business is headed, where finances are headed. God, there's so many things that they're wrestling with here today. And God, I'm not here today to, to, to offer spa, God, that's going to massage every wound and every owie and every little thing that you're going to fix it all today. But Lord, you've taught us today about wrestling God. The God that comes down and contends with us, that's there with us in the fight of our faith. And now in this critical moment, God, in wrestling with some of these things, Lord, we just, we just come to the end of ourselves and we just let all of our own strength go and we hold on to you and we cling on to you. Submit ourselves to you, surrender to you. Say, God, we're not going to let you go until you bless us. God, it's the cry of real men and women of God here today. Spiritual giants. God's spiritual babies will sit and say, well, I'm going to turn my back because God's not giving me answers. God's not saying anything. God's not telling me anything. God, men and women of God here today who are forged in faith, forged in the difficulties of life, who understand that Christianity is not just something that following you is not just a walk in the park. It's not just a... It's not just you know, being on the yellow brick road of Oz. God, that it's, it's a tough fight at times. I pray, God, that those that are in that moment will surrender to you. Surrender to you. Surrender to your plan, your purpose, not knowing what lays, lies ahead, not knowing what's ahead of them tomorrow or next week or even a month from now. God, not, not knowing what's going to go on, what's going to take on, but they surrender to you and submit themselves to you. Father, I thank you for the life change that's taken place here today, for giving us new identity and new confidence in you. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Amen. I want to challenge you today. Uh, Pastor Daniel's getting ready to come. We're going to take our offering. Matter of fact, ushers can come forward.